thank you very much, Helmut, for this generous presentation. I also want to thank uh, the Racial Carson Center, particularly um, Christoph, the staff, all the students, and my colleagues for providing a very interesting space for exchanging and conducting uh, research. Um, what I want to present today is a research that I have been conducted in the last couple of years, and I, be I became interested to know why a city like Medellin, that is Colombia's second biggest city, why water became such a contested issue, despite that the city has a universal coverage and it has, is located in an area of uh, privileged hydrological conditions. But before I move on to the case study, I would like to introduce a bit um, some contemporary water debates uh, taking place at the international scale. So if we look at the sustainable development goals, they have some ambitious uh, targets. And one of those is the number six, that is ensuring or to ensure access to clean water and sanitation for all. And the goal states that without better infrastructure and management, millions of people will continue to die every year. And at the same time, they pose here the question or the issue of water scarcity, saying that affects more than 40% percent of the global population and is projected to rise. So what I want to show with this presentation is to, to we need to move a bit beyond this techno-managerial approaches of explaining lack of access to water. And we also need to naturalize um, these water scarcity discourses. Who is producing them? Who is mobilizing them? And instead we need to argue or to politicize why some social group has some social groups have abundant, abundant and unlimited access to water, and some of them not. And this is the point of departure of this research, which I located in the field of urban political ecology. So now moving to the case of Medellin. Um, uh, the water uh, in the city is provided by this um, utility company. It's called EPM. It's uh, Public Enterprises of Medellin. It's a public company that operates on the commercial principle. So it's a form of corporatization. It's a monopoly. It's a company that not only provides water and sanitation, but also provides energy, gas, and tele telecommunication services and solid waste collection. Um, it serves a population of 4 million people. And since 2010, the city has been um, expanding internationally. Nowadays, uh, is the first provider of energy in Central America after buying the energy utility companies in Panama, Salvador, and Guatemala. Is running some uh, water treatment plants in Mexico, and I have bought some desalinization plant in Chile and a wind park. So this has been an interesting turning point for the company to expand in the, in the, in the Latin American market and consolidate as a multi-Latina. So it means like a multinational company with origins in Latin America. Um, so this has. Um, represented a high increment in his total revenues. And it was, has been quite beneficial for the municipality of Medellin because it's the owner of the company. So by law, 30% of, of the revenue of the company has to, be to, has to be transferred to the municipality and the municipality uses for social uh, investment programs. So parallelly to this internationalization of the company, water inequalities in Medellin have been increased. So if we look at this map, I mean, the company argues that it's providing one, almost 100% coverage. But if you look in this map, these dark points that you will see here are households that have been disconnected for no payment. So 80% of households in the city, they are disconnected. One of the reasons, as I mentioned, is for no payment. They cannot pay their bills. And by law, the company disconnects. So if we look at the social economic certification, one is the poorest and six is the richest. So this is economic certification that exists in Colombia to facilitate cross subsidization. So the, the richest, there is a strata six and five, they pay more. So strata one, two, and three, they pay less. So um, as you see here, these dark points are disconnected for no payment. And also there are 35,000 households that are located in the, outside the city. They don't even appear in the map because they are illegal. So they are illegal time the legal land tenure status. So by law, the company cannot, cannot provide water in these areas. But I was very dissatisfied with mainstream explanations of the water, from the water company and the uh, municipality that trying to explain this problem of disconnection for no payment as a poverty trap. People are very poor, so they cannot pay the real, so that's why we disconnected. Or we cannot provide access to the peripheries that are quite steep because 
I mean, land is illegal and also because of technical difficulties. So this is the main explanation that the company is using or deploy. But here, my main argument is that um, in order to understand why inequalities are being reinforced and consolidated in the city, we need to trace the pro corporatization process of the water company. So in this way, I suggest that the competitive logic of EPM has constituted an interplay because between water scarcity resources, sorry, water scarcity discourses, ideals of citizenship, and infrastructure networks through which water inequalities are facilitated and sustained. And what is my scientific contribution here? We know a lot about privatization of water. We know that it's bad, has not been worked, and it has not failed to provide water to the poor. But we have we little that we don't we don't know much about the impacts of public companies running under market-oriented principles. So this is a form of entrepreneurial organization that is called corporatization. So it's no privatization, it's corpora corporatization. It's the most dominant form of public enterprise today. It's not so contested as privatization, and there's not enough um, scientific literature in this field. So this research attempts to address this gap in, in, the, in the scientific literature. Um, so uh, I would like to show you through the presentation that one productive way to understand water inequalities is through contestations. But how, how can we understand or analyze contestation? So if we look at this photo here, uh, I will show how productive is look at these contestations through, through two different parallel processes that are happening simultaneously. One is commodification, that is for instance, this tube was built by the water company where water flows with some particular physical and social characteristics and in some particular um, infrastructures. And also decommodification. This is being built by the, water, uh, by the communities uh, with, and also have their own logic. So by bringing these two cases together, I think it's a very productive way to unpack the political issues behind inequalities and to understand why contestations occur. So I will start with this, the first process that is called commodifica commodification. Here I will bring some historical analysis of the water company from two historical periods. The first one I call municipalization and the second one corporatization. And then I will move to the second actor that is the, the state. What is the role of the state in all this contestation? So moving to the first uh, part, that is the municipalization. EPR was uh, founded in 1955. Uh, what is very interesting here is the beginning was characterized by the construction of large scale and capital intensive infrastructure projects. So with the help of international laws, the company embarked in the construction of dams, as we can see here, and also in the construction of large infrastructure um, networks, uh, storage tanks, potabilization uh, plants, etc. cetera. Uh, the most important was to provide uh, that the, the city could be modernized and it could be modernized by the implementation or the construction of the, this infrastructure. All this model of universal access was driven by the local elites, mostly by engineers. So we can see during this period that the function of Medellin and the consolidation of the water company was strongly dependent on the urbanization of nature, which means bringing water into the city. Parallel to this process, the city experienced a growth uh, rate of migration from rural areas to the, um, to the city as a consequence of the political violence and also job opportunities uh, provided by the manufacturing industry. But this led to a growth of informal settings. And so somehow the city was growing in a very chaotic way. So EPM assumed the role of legitimizing the state by provision of water services. What can be very interesting here is water became a mechanism of citizenship recognition. As soon as EPM provides water to a particular household, it means that land is being legalized, so you are legal in the city, you are recognized, but because of occurring this right, you have the moral responsibility to pay. So this is what's very interesting foundation to start a culture of payment in, in Medellin. That is, a, I think the, until now, it's a very strong culture of people paying their bills. And also during that time, um, water was perceived as a public good provided by the state, and it has to be provided at affordable prices. 
Also, water was used as a way to, for changing social practices. So, in-house connection to the infrastructure network was considered as a no social norm. So, it was almost uh, the company felt obliged to provide water to every single house. And because it was considered as an integral component of the modern citizen. What is very interesting here is that this is an advertisement that came in the late 70s. And it was the necessity of the um, EPM not just to provide physical access to, to the infrastructure, but also to convince consumers that they have to increase the consumption of water and electricity. So that's why they created particular programs where you can buy electrical appliances just to maintain high the consumption of water and energy. So in the 90s, uh, there were some uh, transformations in the national constitution, particularly in the, in the laws regarding to water, and it allowed the participation of public sector. So this uh, introduced new laws and regulations in which water companies can be public or private, or public-private partnership, they have to operate with the same rules, and they have to be competitive, and they have to be economically efficient. So as a result, uh, the water tariffs increased quite dramatically, affecting the, the urban poor. So by law, this uh, water EPM can disconnect uh, households, as I mentioned before, for non-payment. So what, is, what kind of strategies is EPM doing to, to facilitate that water runs as a commercial good? So one of the first strategies I want to show here is the framing water as a scarce commodity. So this part of the city is uh, located in an area of rich hydrological conditions. As soon as water comes into the city, it becomes scarce. So this is one advertisement that the water company produced in 2013 to criminalize illegal practices. So what is very interesting here is that um, a dry dam, I mean an empty dam, is being portrayed portrays nature as a defenseless, a vulnerable. And it, it shows apocalyptic visions like, if you don't pay for water, look what is going to happen. So this is a very, I mean, this doesn't exist. This is Photoshop. It's being produced. So there's a way to, not just to put environmental issues at the center, this is going to happen if you don't pay, but also to criminalize illegal practices and to send to prison six years if somebody gets stopped illegally. But what's very interesting here in this, advertisements is the reasons for why people are getting illegally connected are not being discussed. The second strategy that is being used by the company is to create a differentiation between good and bad citizens. One of them is uh, this kind of projects or programs that are uh, to reward those who pay their bills on time or, for, or for keeping the culture of payment. So this is a photo I took at the entrance of the planetarium, and it says that if you belong to the socioeconomic strata, one, two, three, that is the lowest socioeconomic strata in the city, and you show your pay bill, you can enter for free until five people. So it's a very interesting way how the co water company starts to reward those uh, customers that pay on time. But here it's very important to, to ask ourselves until which point out on these kind of program, programs blur the line between citizens and, and consumers. Another um, in, a strategy is the implementation, the recent implementation of prepaid water systems. So it has been introduced since 2015 as an innovative solution to reduce disconnection. And it's very innovative because it adjusts to the capacity of payment. Uh, so what's happening here is this uh, EPM removes the conventional meter and replaces it for a um, prepay meter. So customers then get this card, it's called a smart card, so you recharge it according to the capacity to pay. They are, uh, you can recharge one euro, or you can recharge until 15 minutes. Um, and 10% of this recharge goes to pay the debts with it to the water company. What is the problem with this machine or this small device? This has been highly criticized and even banned elsewhere in the world, like for instance in the UK, because it's deepening existing social spatial inequalities. I mean, this um, device is so expensive to install that it's just being installed in the, in the, in the poorest areas. And the other one is that it's very criticized because it doesn't solve the problem of disconnection for no payment. 
because actually when uh, customer routes are out of money, it's self-disconnecting or after disconnecting. So what is very interesting is just the prepaid system doesn't come to just the technical device, it comes together with some pedagogical programs. So the water company goes to door to door to the, to the households to explain how they have to use domestic appliances. So here the aim is not to make water calculable, but also to create a calculative rationality by shaping consumption according to the capacity to pay. So here, uh, domestic appliances facilitate the dissemination and adaptation of environmental conscious lifestyles. So contrary to the municipalization period where uh, electrical appliances were promoted as a way to increase consumption, here um, there is a very interesting training program to teach uh, or educate poor households how to reduce consumption. So here we can see that showers, just four minutes, Laundry, just when the washing machine is full. Cooking, just with a lid. And please close your tap when you are uh, washing your dishes. So just a uh, reduction in consumption is the main target of this pre um, educational program. Other strategy uh, deployed by EPM is, the, um, is water is used as a to enhance aesthetic and environmental values. Despite that water doesn't run, run abundantly in many poor areas of the city, it runs abundantly in these areas like parks and, and uh, drinking fountains. So what is very interesting here is how environmental uh, issues come at the forefront and while leaving behind uh, social aspects as a, in, the, in, in the second stage. Um, and this is a form what Karel Becker calls uh, market environmentalism. So what is the role of the state in all this, this story? Um, at the national level, there is a cont contradiction in the institutional framework. We have a law that allows companies to disconnect households for no payment. But at the same time, there is the constitutional uh, court that forbids companies to disconnect households for no payment when it, the households are inhabited by children, by internally displaced people, elders, and single mothers. So I was wondering, um, what is the, the role of the municipality here? Because the municipality is the owner of EPM. And I found out that it has been itself silent and complicit with EPM disconnect household for no payment. And one of the main reasons is because the municipality has a strong dependence of the EPM revenues. 32% of the, of the programs that are contained in the development plan of the city are financed by the transfer of the water company. So now we will move to the second um, process of metabolism that I call decommodification. I will look at through, through different, two different um, actors. One is disconnected households, and the second one is heterogeneous waters. Um, I initiated a household survey asking why people cannot pay their bills. And um, surprisingly, the most common reason for no payment is inability to pay. According to the results, uh, most of the respondents claim that they spend around 30% of their monthly bills, of their monthly income on bills. Uh, however, uh, reasons for non-payment are complex and they go beyond the inability to pay. So one of the main reasons of, that is leading to, to this connection, they are going behind this non-economic, uh, okay, economic aspects, is complexity in bill format. Simply people cannot understand how the bill is being calculated so they cannot communicate in case of having some complaints with the, with the water company. Also, in flexible payment programs, the water company has deployed different kinds of repair uh, pay programs that people can come and prepare their bills. But simply, um, according to the household survey, 60% of these households have approached to APM, so there is a very strong desire to get reconnected legally. But it's, many of them have to quit the, the, this, this program because it's very hard to pay bills and parallelly pay in debts. Also, there is um, an, aware, an awareness of legal mechanisms to reclaim the, work, the, the right to water. As I explained before, uh, the Constitutional Court allow um, or gives some legal mechanisms to low-income households to sue the company. And the majority of times, they, they win because water is a human right. But why people are not using this legal mechanism? Because there is a strong feeling of shame and culpability for not being able to to, to pay their water and bills. 
So as we see in this quotation, somebody said, it's hard not to pay an additional reclaim rights. So the only way how you reclaim rights is by paying your bill. So when, when disconnected households, I mean, when the water company comes and disconnects a household, how do they secure access to water on an everyday basis? So here I found out very interesting um, the, uh, strategies, how people cope with the lack of access to water. So the first one is um, what happened with um, the water company when some household uh, accumulates two or seven bills without payment. The water company suspended. And the suspension consists of EPM installs a trickle valve to temporarily restrict the flow of water in the house until uh, debts are paid. So how people arrange, what kind of social technical arrangements are being deployed by the households? So the first one is, there's a strong uh, solidarity form. So uh, neighbors, neighbors have to try, uh, try to help themselves, families, so you share kitchen, you share uh, toilets, and people are trying to save money to, to help um, paying back their, their debts. Um, also people fetch water from the streams, carry buckets with the water, and also it's mostly an individual struggle. Everybody's uh, fighting individually to get reconnected legally again. So when you accumulate more than the seven uh, bills, what EPM does is just you're cut off. And it means that you, your pipe or your meter, your conventional meter is being removed, like this one in this case. So you can see that the, this water has been cut off completely from the, from the water service. Um, so what kind of social technical arrangements are being deployed by the households? So there is no other option that connected illegally to EPM water, uh, despite of severe punishments. And who can, um, facilitates this illegal connection? Mostly are uh, local plumbers or criminal bonds, and they set up prices. So now their household has not, doesn't have to deal directly with EPM, but just with the with the criminal bonds that they set up particular prices and set up particular arrangements. And then when asking uh, households why, how you feel connecting illegally, and they simply said, I mean, we know that it's bad, but water is a public good and it's supposed to be provided by a public company. Another interesting case, um, I found it in the peripheries of Medellin. These are households that cannot have access to formal to the formal access to, to the EPM water because they are in, a, in the informal settlement. So I found a very interesting um, way of community organization. Is this uh, this uh, form has been working for 50 years and what happened is this, this uh, infrastructure parasite to a one tank of EPM that has a technical problem. So when the tank is full, water overflows. So people saw that water was constantly being wasted and they construct this very interesting um, infrastructure. As I mentioned, it has been working for 50 years. There are more than 1,000 uh, households that depend on this infrastructure. Um, they, they, a fixed payment doesn't exist. Everybody pays according to their capacity to pay. They have, uh, it's managed by a fontanero. A fontanero is a person that is selected by the community to provide some maintenance and to collect the fees. And this system does not exclude anybody, and it has generated a strong sense of community and a mechanism to reclaim all the rights, like right to health, education, electricity, etc. But it was, what is very interesting here is that EPM doesn't intervene in this infrastructure. I was wondering why is the reason behind it? And the reason is because it's raw water. So for the water company, it has not passed through some potabilization process, so it doesn't have any commercial value. So that's why they don't interfere this kind of infrastructure, contrary to the other um, case studies where people tap illegally to potable water. And here is where the water home company has to interfere. So just to finish, I would like to bring some, some reflections to this discussion. Uh, when we talk about water, and uh, particularly access to water in cities, I think we will have to move from this public and private ownership debate. Um, as the case of corporatization or EPM shows, um, these kind of forms of entrepreneurial organizations are brewing the line between what is public and what is public, and all these elements mixed together. So we need to move to, from the, from away from this debate on ownership. 
Also to look at infrastructure, not just as a technical issue, but as a social technical issue. And looking at big infrastructure and also as a small infrastructure, micro infrastructures, like I say, I show here the meter or the prepay meter, because they are not static object, objects or neutral artifacts, but they are social technical configurations or assemblages that simultaneously involve technical artifacts, discourses, regulatory regimes, corporate interests and preference and aspirations. So it is more than technical. Also, what I point out that is very interesting or important to look is at the materiality of water. When I started the research, I realized that there was not just the water from the company EPM flowing. There are different kinds of water. There is raw, potable, illegal, legal, public EPM water, prepaid water. And I think these different kinds of water come to influence the ways that disconnected households secure access to to this resource on an everyday basis and determine the extent to which EPM intervenes in infrastructures and modes of household or community organization. And the last point I want to bring is the Medellin's urban waterscape is a produced social natural identity. It's not something natural, it's being produced. And it reflects not only the logics of the EPM, of the water company, but also the everyday struggles to secure access to water in poor areas. So I think a very interesting way is to bring all these two metabolism process together to look how contestations are emerging and how can we contribute to reduce inequalities in, 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 in cities. Um, I will leave it like this. Um, thank you very nice much indeed for your attention.